Welcome aboard applicants. I thought we would begin with the first year law students exam, November 2020, essay question number two. As with all of our essay questions, we begin with a call of the question, so let's begin there. Number one, what claim or claims can Martha bring against Carl, if any, discuss? Two, what de defense or defenses can Carl assert against Martha, if any, discuss? Three, what claim or claims can Martha bring against John, if any, discuss? And four, what defense or defenses can John assert against Martha, if any, discuss? So let's start with, I'll uh, start hammering out this answer now. One, we have uh, Martha v. Carl. And then number two, we have Carl's defenses question mark. Now three, we have Martha V. Oh, thank you for your patience on that. John. And then number four, John's discussion, John's def defenses. Okay. Now, we don't know what area of law we're dealing with yet. So I'm just, we're going to, we can actually peek a little bit up here to see if anything about a contract, don't see anything there. So let's start reading our question now. Martha is a college, college student living in a con condominium condo owned by her uncle John. On various occasions, John promised Martha that he would give her the condo when she graduates, which she will do in a few months. Martha has suggested to John that the condo needed repainting. Recently, John saw his friend Carl, a painter, and offered him... Oh, right, right here, I'm already seeing that, that we're already in, in, in contract law, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to say that we're going to have contract law on all these. So let, let's come down here now and put in our contract law shopping list, contract formation, third party rights. We, after that, do covenants, conditions, excuses, discharge duties, perform, breach of contract and remedies, copy and paste that under Martha versus John. Right here, okay, perfect, okay. Now, let's continue reading now. Actually, let's, yeah, right here. After, um, recently, John saw his friend Carl, a painter, and offered him 3000 if Carl would, would, within the next three weeks, repaint the interior walls of my small condo where my niece Martha lives. John said that he would supply Carl with all the paint. Carl orally agreed to do the, do the painting, thinking that the condo was in, the, was in the same city where John and Carl lived. In fact, the condo was 250 miles away. Two weeks later, Carl's painting truck, <clears throat> excuse me, two weeks later, Carl's painting truck with all of his equipment was destroyed in an accident that was not Carl's fault. When Carl called John to tell him that he would not be able to repaint or to, re, to paint the condo as scheduled, he learned for the first time that the condo was 250 miles away. Carl told John that he was very, that he very much doubted, I want to point out here, very much doubted that might very much doubted that he would be able to replace his truck and equipment quickly. Carl also Carl also told John that even when even then he would not be able to paint a condo 250 miles away for three thousand dollars unless John paid all his his lodging and, and expenses. John told Carl, "Let's forget about the whole thing." Martha was disappointed to hear that John was not going to have the condo repainted. She told him that she would pay someone else three thousand dollars to have it done at her painting contractor's suggestion she paid she paid him an additional twelve thousand to install a new kitchen floor new kitchen appliances and new bathroom fixtures after martha graduated john told her that he could no longer afford no longer afford hold on to that idea I'll no longer afford to give her the condo and instead he would he and instead would be selling it now Let's come back up here now. Now that we have all of our our, our questions in their proper or you know answers to the questions in their proper order, let's come back up here now with our shopping list in mind. Read it. Read our question for an issue spotting focus. Okay. Now Martha is, is a college student living in a cond condominium condo owned by her uncle John. On various occasions, John promised 
Martha that he would give her the condo when she, when she graduates, which she will do in a few months. So right here, so we have we have a lot, we have a promise, John promising Martha. Okay, uh, what, that he would give her the condo when she graduates. See, we have a promise here with a possible condition aspect. We're just, we're just highlighting this at this point. Martha had suggested to John that the condo needed repainting. Recently, John saw his friend Carl, a painter, and offered him $3,000 if Carl would, within the next three weeks, repaint the interior walls of my condo where my niece Martha lives. Okay, right here. It's this aspect right here that we're looking at in terms of the offer that what is it John and Carl so down here remember Martha v Carl and Martha v John this is this is where things get really interesting because the contract with John and Carl is where Martha is going to get her rights okay now John <clears throat> said that he would supply Carl with all the paint uh, Carl orally agreed to do the painting I'm oh, sorry that said that he would supply Carl with all the all the paint uh, Carl orally agreed to do the painting, thinking that the condo was in the same city where John, where both John and Carl lived. In fact, the condo was 250 miles away. So, right here, we want to make sure to point out that in Martha v. Carl, we're we're going to be looking at the contract between John and Carl, and this is where we want to want to start here. Applicable law. Let's see here. Well, actually, you know what? We should probably up above here. Bring this down. Actually, I'm bringing this back up. Thanks for your patience. Okay, right here. Applicable law. Between John and Carl, we're dealing with services because we're dealing with painting. So we're doing the common law. And the painting, the services here would be painting. Okay. Now, now we come down after, after applicable law, we're doing contract formation. And under contract formation, we got offer. Remember, under offer, we've got intent to be bound. This is where we have the certain and definite terms. Remember, our, their acronym for that is Q-tips, which we will talk about here because when we come up here, we find out that he offered him $3,000. There's your price. Carl and John are, are the parties. The time to perform within the next three weeks. And what is the subject matter? Repaint the ex interior walls of what the small condo, one small, one small, um, or say one repainting of the interior walls of a small condo would, would be the quantity. Now everything seems sufficient. So we have, we have a, an offer here that was also communicated. We'll make, don't forget about that. Now, was it accepted? Okay, now let's take him up here. John said that he would supply Carl with all the paint. Now, Carl orally agreed. Now this also too, um, so that all the all the paint required would would be supplied by by Carl. Um, sorry, sorry, would be supplied by John as well. This will actually help uh, talk further uh, later on for remedies I believe now Carl orally agreed to do to do the painting now uh, thinking that the condo was in the same city where both John and Carl lived okay now that's that is I'll make sure to okay that so he he accepted was there a consideration or bargain for exchange legal detriment also coming down here the statute of frauds now remember we're dealing dealing with uh, services contract that by its terms can be completed within a year because we're dealing with three weeks so the need for a writing is not necessary here even though we have the aspect that uh, Carl orally agreed to do the painting so but here's the main the main thing we want to point out here that in fact the condo was 250 miles away that's a mistake the step uh, absolutely what what about third party benefit? yes exactly um, okay, satisfied. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about under Martha. We first have to establish the contract in order for Martha to then be able to bring um, the, the, the claim. I, I, we could actually bring this underneath Martha and Carl, I believe. Well, right right now, I'll just I'll just we'll just outline this. We have mistake, and I believe what we have here. See what we who who knows about the 250 miles away? 
that would be I believe it would be John here because right here it says um, where okay when when was it that <clears throat> when was it that Carl realized that it was 250 miles away <clears throat> excuse me um, Carl told John that, okay that's right so John Carl was the one that actually was mistaken so we have a unilateral mistake here and coming down here so we, we want to make sure to tie this aspect here that um, this is when uh, Carl realized that it was 250 miles away with the aspect that this is was in the right here as to the two this so this sentence here concerning the 250 miles away the condo being 250 miles away and then down here about the 250 miles away the condo so make sure to tie those into your unilateral mistake argument now now two weeks later now remember this is these these are defenses though and if this one uh, is okay the, these two that we're talking about here uh, this would be Carl's defenses down down here. So as we as we come up with defenses, we want to make sure to plug those into the right spots. So okay, okay. Now and then now was there was there a a a, a, a we'll say an agreement that has been forged between John and Carl? Yes. Now at this point we have a contract formation. And like pointed out, yes, at time of contracting, that's exactly right. Because it was for who up here, and I want to point this out with a with a different highlighter color points out here um, where where my niece lives. Or right, the niece Martha lives right here. Oh, let me highlight. There we go. There we go. Right there. <clears throat> As <clears throat> excuse me. We're dealing with a third party beneficiary contract. That's what we're going to point out as to what Martha versus Carl at this point. And when we're establishing the third party beneficiary contract, we're making sure that the parties, original parties contracting John and Carl, at the time they were contracting, they they were intending to benefit Martha, which is exactly the case here, where Martha, <clears throat> where his niece Martha lives. Now here's the other thing about this. Um, Martha, here John, okay, on various occasions, John had, John had promised Martha they would give her the condo when she graduates which she will do in a few months. Now the thing about this was is who was the one that suggested about the repainting? Martha. So that this this actually goes to this as well. So I want to make sure to point this out that we're dealing with somebody too that um, is aware that the condo will be repainted. So uh, that'll be helpful out with uh, with vesting concerning the third party. We want to make sure at this point that they were contemplated at the time of contract formation that they were intended <clears throat> intended a or intended third party that, that as a third party intended third party that they were now is this a Donny Donny yeah absolutely or is it a creditor she's not owed something by by John so I was got to say so we're dealing with a with a Donny creditor here I'm sorry Donny third party but beneficiary after that we're dealing with vesting and <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the three ways that vesting can take place: we got material, vet, we got okay, um, learning and setting. We got material reliance and or mater, well, changing, change um, when when one when one changes their position in reliance upon, and when they bring suit to enforce. When well, this situation, I would actually say this most likely is at least bringing suit to enforce, and possibly learning and assenting, but most likely uh, bringing suit to enforce. Now, two weeks later, Carl's painting truck with all of its equipment, also time is of the essence. Very nice, well, very good. We want to point that out here as well, that we're dealing with <clears throat> a condition, precedent. And remember here, with we're dealing with consideration here, we're also dealing with the aspect, oh, so that actually, down, down here. Uh, that, that, that would have been for a gift. Yeah. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Condition preceding to, uh, time is of the essence. Exactly. 
remember here we're dealing with the aspect about hey, what type of condition precedent this is. We're dealing with an express. This isn't in, this isn't constructive. This is time is of the essence express, which means it has to be strictly complied with. Okay, and therefore, if any anything um, it anything is missing, you the argument could be made that it didn't it didn't um, it, it wasn't it wasn't um, at, strictly complied with. <laughs> to, you know, okay now. After express condition, we want to make sure that we're we're ruling out uh, anything concerning covenants and excuses. Now, after express condition, uh, was there anything later in our question? Two weeks later, Carl's painting truck with all of his equipment was destroyed in an automobile accident that was not Carl's fault. So this is the aspect too about what what was this the Carl's painting truck? Well, it was this uh, unable to perform. So we want to make sure to argue about impossibility that Carl's going to say it was impossible for him to perform. So discharge the duty through impossibility. And remember this this isn't this this isn't um, uh, prevention because it wasn't his fault, okay? So this is more discharge duty through impossibility. And after that now, okay, so we, we took care of that. Highlight that now. What about his truck? That's exact. What now? Uh, well, see that that's what we're talking about here. It's the the destruction of it. If he if he can't travel the distance, it, he he could argue that his duty duty to perform, even though it may have matured, it's impossible for him to perform because he doesn't he no longer has his, has his has his truck with all of his equipment. But it wasn't his fault, so it's not it's not the argument could. Be, the argument is not prevention, it's more of impossibility. Exactly. Now when Carl called John to tell him what he that, that he would not be able to paint the condo as scheduled, there we go. Click. That's that's our, our anticipatory repudiation right there. Okay. And okay, now here we go. And make sure, because we're going through here, we're making sure we're using all the facts. He learned for the first time that the condo was 250 miles away. Remember, we talked about that. That's that was already in our on our uh, writing because we talked about that under unilateral mistake. Carl told John that he very much doubted. Well, that's he that he would be able to replace his truck and equipment quickly. So we're dealing with the very much doubted aspect. See, even though he he's told John. That he would not be able to paint the condo as scheduled, which is the anticipatory repudiation. He's now saying that he very much doubted, which is this is that aspect too. That remember, unequivocal. The uh, the aspect of anticipatory repudiation is the unequivocal communication that the other party will not perform before time for performance is due. Um, that telling him that he's very much doubted that he would not he would, would be able to replace his truck and, equ and, equ and equipment quickly. Carl told John. Now Carl told John also told John that even then he would not be able to paint a condo 250 miles away for three thousand dollars unless and this to me sounds like we're we're um, heading heading into a modification aspect unless John paid all his travel and lodging expenses now John told Carl let's forget about the whole thing so this is that down here we've got uh, possible possible repudiation but it looks to me like we could very well be doing modification as well. Remember, modification requires mutual on, only doubt. It. That's exactly right. That's right. I want to point that out here and up up here. Doubted. So mo modification requires mu mutual assent between the parties. And because we're dealing with unit, uh, dealing with uh, common law, we require new consideration, which was not which was not present here. So the modification was did not did not happen. And we have another anticipatory repudiation possibility by John. So we'll make sure to point this out here that. Carl doubted, and down here we got repudiation. John said um, 
or he call, called the whole thing off. Okay, now point that out here. Okay, at this point, let's see. Okay, now, so we've talked about all this now. Let's make sure to, that we're using all of our facts in the appropriate slots. Now, Martha was disappointed to hear that John was not going to have the condo repainted. So she told him that, that she would pay someone else $3,000 to have it done. Now, down here under John, I believe what we could, we could be possibly bringing in here is, is uh, remedies that, that Martha could recover. She's going to try to recover from John the cost of having to pay the substitute um, uh, Re condo repainter, for lack of a better term there. Okay, and so right here we got Martha was disappointed to hear that John was not going to have the condo repainted. So she told him that she would pay someone else 3000 to have it done. So we're talking here about the, okay, so what would that be under, under our remedies from John, or sorry, Martha v. John here? Remember, at expe actually, we're doing a mitigation of damages, expectation, and this would be the uh, cost of substitute performance. And then we come down here, we talk about consequentials. And this is where we have Hadley versus Baxendale. Okay. And then we do incidental. Okay sure to come up here okay now so at, at her painting contractor's suggestion she told or she paid him an additional 12,000 to install a new kitchen floor new kitchen appliances and new bathroom fixtures and this is where in inside of expectation damages for between from uh, Martha and, and Carl we're looking at this aspect here okay first of all we're looking at uh, foreseeability and reasonable amount so this wasn't something that that was caught was told to her communicated to her that 12,000 was something that wasn't foreseeable so I don't think she would be able to claim 12,000 for the additional Although she could try to, she's going to try to argue that. Remember, under consequentials, remember consequentials are, remember, for, it's the foreseeability, reasonable amount at the time of contract formation. We're up here under expectation damages is more of the benefit of the bargain. So I'm going to slide this down here. Thank you for your patience with me on that. And we'll. So she might be able under under expectation to get the to get the three thousand. If that's if that's available now under under this though, the argument is that it wasn't foreseeable and the and the amount may not be reasonable in comparison to the three thousand dollar contract price. These are three things are technically something that she wanted to have wanted to have her contractor perform for her, and I don't I don't believe that she'd be able to apply that to John. Now uh, okay, so that would be the twelve thousand. Make sure I had the number right on that. Okay, and remember, incidental damages would be all the cost of related relating to her uh, mi mitigating the breach. Now, up here, we don't want to forget now that we're dealing dealing or still still dealing with Martha and Carl in terms of the uh, third party uh, beneficiary contract. So she was an intended third party beneficiary, donee, vesting. The vesting took place by by. Um, let's make sure to throw in a conclusion here as well took place by her uh, bringing suit to enforce. Okay, and up here. Okay, and so down here under Carl's defenses, he'd probably, he's, oh, let's see here. Does Carl have any defenses? That's a very good point. I would say at least two here, statute of frauds and uh, unilateral mistake, and possibly, um, see, I, because of the the 250 miles 
we already talked about all this here, so let's highlight that so that we can rule out this, okay? After Martha graduated, John told her that he could no longer afford to give her the condo and instead would be selling it. So there we go. Now here, underneath John's, John's defenses, we have uh, financial impracticability. Discharge of duty, impracticability. And, you know, that other aspect, I think, yeah, because down here he says, I no longer afford to give her the condo and instead would be selling it. Okay, yeah, financial, commercial, and practicability. Now, I think we pretty much have nailed this. Um, we'll come back down here and make sure we've con yeah, concluded on to all this. So we have Carl, statute of frauds, unilateral mistake. Now, do you see, uh, do you see Carl having any additional defenses that I'm not seeing? We don't want to forget about something too. Underneath that history repudiation, there was a breach of contract. Substantial performance. Which I would say we have a material breach. We don't want to forget about that. Okay. I was looking at, okay. Okay, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, let, 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 me, let me come up here. Okay. Okay, there's there's the there's the question. Um, okay. Thank you for your patience with me. Do you, do you see any any uh, defenses here that I'm not I'm not seeing about from Carl? You know what you know what what I thought can can Martha get anything from Carl? See that's that's the aspect here is I would have to say that because she can she as a third party beneficiary. No, and that's exactly right. I don't see that. You're exactly right. I don't. I don't. I don't see that as happening because because Carl was. He's going to argue that he wasn't. He wasn't the one that was in breach. It was actually John. But the the sitch is that even though even though her rights may may have vested, what the up here? Let, let me come back up here again. Because this is what what makes this uh, this question here quite slightly challenging, um, is that that right here, um, Carl was unable to perform, and he was telling John about his inability to perform, inability to perform, unless John paid all the tra travel and lodging expenses, and then John told Carl that these, that that um, he said let's forget about it. So John was the one that called it off. It wasn't Carl. But can yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say, but till um, that's right. But until he talked about it, right, right, because there wasn't there there her vesting, that that was the aspect is did her vesting come before the modification? See, that's that's the aspect about that, and I, I would say absolutely yes on that one. The modification vesting conclusion. The only thing that that would defeat the vesting aspect is modification. So, could could she get the money back from her painter? That's a good point. That down here under under her recovery against John, she might be able to. Well, see, that's she would she would have to pay three thousand. I I don't see. I don't, I don't, I don't think so because uh, she's just going to try to argue the twelve thousand from consequentials that wasn't foreseeable between her and John. That was just for the repainting of the condo, and it wasn't even a reasonable amount twelve thousand versus three, uh, three thousand. But I think she can. She oh, well, she's going to try to recover expectation, the cost of benefit of the bargain with John concerning John that that um, for the for the three 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 thousand. Boy, this this is a this is a rather uh, challenging question. Um, I I really hope we're on the on the right right route uh, road here, um, but I I, th I think this is a um, you know oh, because John was going to pay for the painting and then she and then she said um, she would pay. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see here. Uh, she was okay. 
disappointed to hear that John was not see oh she, she found out that John was not going to have the condo repainted okay so she told him that she would pay someone else three thousand to have it done hmm so what do you th yeah that's that's really interesting that I've never I've you know I've never encountered that uh, situation before what do you what do you think that that issue is on this on this point See, I, I think at this point she's going to try to say that that John, who technically was the party who's you know the the promisor of in a sense, okay, um, is the one that told told her um, about uh, for first of all she told told her that he would repaint the condo for her, okay. Number two, or not not, not him, sorry, he would get someone Carl to repaint the condo for her. Number two, that um, so so she she ha had her rights vest, but there's that aspect about modification. Then she's disappointed to hear that she was not that the condo was not going to get repainted, so she decides to pay someone three thousand to have it done. Replacement. Wow, that's uh, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that one. That is that is definitely a very <laughs> interesting issue. Okay, so I, th I think we'll um, put a bookmark on this one. We'll have to come back and uh, we might we might come back and visit this again as we, you know, have a better understanding of, of things in this in this particular question. But now let's switch gears and go to the next question. Okay, now question number three. June 2004, and as with all of our essay questions, let's begin with the call of the question. One, what criminal charges, if any, should be brought against Art and Ben? Discuss. Oh, and then, um, and then when the uncle keeps the condo, she has the money into the appliances. See, that's right up here. That's what I was talking about, the consequential damages she's going to possibly argue. But here's the thing about it is, could she argue that the 3000 is is reliance damages? Because she's not, she hasn't actually taken any particular reliance measures, and that, that's what I'm saying. We, we want to make sure to point out as well that uh, between uh, Martha and John, that remember we have the gift. That it's it's uh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Oh, there she. There, so are you saying that that she there was some form of reliance damages on this? on the promise. Interesting. Promissory estoppel. And that's that is really interesting. As a substitute for consideration, which means that yes, okay. So we, yeah, exactly right. So a promissory estoppel, remember a substitute for consideration for the whole for the full contract price or it can it can supply a remedy for um for reliance damages. So make sure to point that in down here. Okay. From the uncle. That's exactly right. John. Yep. Specific specific performance requiring John to to perform. See that that this isn't specific performance because we're dealing dealing with an employment contract. But what are you are you saying that he requiring him to specific perform specifically perform his um, uh, promise to her? Maybe. Mm. See, I, I, I think it's iffy. I'll throw it in here as a question mark. Question mark here. Okay. Yep. You know what? And we'll just put it like like we said. Yeah, he must give her the condo. Yeah, that is that is okay. I see what you're saying. Okay, I get it. The promise to get to give the promise to give the condo up here. So let's see what, what it. Um, yeah, promissory estoppel. We yeah, so we have we have uh, off. Okay. We have. Oh, I see what we're saying here. It's the applicable law. Um, common law. 
which is the condo. Okay. And then we have uh, contract formation and then offer. I, th I think we, we could actually just say uh, mutual assent here. And uh, consideration. And remember here, this 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 um, what would what would otherwise look like a gift and consideration technically would be uh, uh, legal detriment. Legal detriment is the big issue here. Okay, and then um, the promissory stop was a substitute for consideration in the event that if there's not sufficient legal detriment in in that we have a gift. Promissory estoppel would be a substitute for consideration, and therefore, breach of contract and what she did, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying here. Wow, that is so yes, breach of contract, remedy, mitigation. We talked about this here as specific specific formats, absolutely land. Which is land is always considered unique. This is like the dress essay, exactly. Yep. All right. So, yeah, I see what you're saying. Very interesting. Oh, conclusion. And then there's an argument too that uh, after consideration we have a condition precedent, which is which was her, um, her the graduation. But the the yeah, but the thing about it because she bought the appliances now, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The reliance damages could could be the could be the appliances, the cost of the appliances. Okay. Yeah, which would which would be the twelve twelve thousand. Very excellent on this. Very good because she was getting the condo. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Person, yep, person shoes. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. Rather, rather than the gown, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. This is great. Okay. You think you think uh, pretty pretty good on this one? So I'll come up here and take. Oh, uh, okay. Good. Okay, we'll go down to the next question now. Okay. Now, with, now with all of our questions here, we go down to the call of the question. What crime or what criminal charges, if any, should be brought against Art and Ben? Discuss. We already know what area of law now. Criminal, uh, criminal law. Uh, what defenses, if any, do Dar do Art and Ben have into the criminal charges? Discuss. Okay. So right here. So we've got uh, one. Crimes of art, question mark, and two, <clears throat> crimes of Ben, question mark. And we're going to throw in a state, the art, and state, the Ben. And remember, too, that we know, now that we know our area of law, Throw down our shopping list here. Murder structure, theft, crimes against the person, solicitation, conspiracy, attempt, and defenses. Copy and paste that under Ben. We should have this thing. Okay. Right here. Perfect. Okay, now bring this to the next page so we can start filling this out. Okay, excellent day. All right. Now, let's read our question. After drinking heavily, drinking heavily, right here, I can already tell you we're going to be having uh, the defense of, into of intoxication, but let's just throw it down here as, as we're seeing it. All 
Okay. And so this would be uh, voluntary intoxication, by the way. So make sure to point that out. Okay. All right. Art and Ben decided to, uh, that they would rob the local all-night convenience store. Okay, so we also have a solicitation conspiracy as well here. So let's start that now. Okay. Solicitation. Merger. Conspiracy. And we're, we want to talk about the Pinkerton's rule, which is co-conspiratorial liability. All acts taken by a co-conspirator is, is attributable to other co-conspirators in the in the conspiracy, and um, all reasonable acts in furtherance. That is, and then uh, Pinkerton's rule. Now I want to make sure. After that, okay, make sure looking looking for accomplice liability as well. So let's throw us down here. Okay. Okay, so we've taken care of this now. I remember too that we're so far we've got uh, these issues we can actually copy and paste this now down uh, under Ben okay don't forget too we gotta make sure to throw in the defense of voluntary intoxication under Ben okie dokie okay now they drove to the they drove Art's truck to the store, overt act and furtherance, enter, oh, entered, right here. So what is it we have here at this point? Burglary, excellent. Okay, now, and remember, remember we're dealing with uh, modern law versus uh, common law, or common law versus modern law. And I believe here what we'd have, because of it being a convenience store, it would be, be the modern law here so if I remember correctly yeah store excuse me and yelled this is a pick this is a stick up while brandishing their unloaded pistols they they just uh, um, the aspect here would be that that even though they present it present a threat that threat uh, to to a person may may be real even though they may know that they don't only have un, unloaded uh, pistols they discovered that the only person in the store in the store um, was Mark, who worked at the store, and Fran, a customer. Art became, yeah, robbery, exactly, but there hasn't been anything taken yet, though. That's the only thing. You're right, though. You're right. Art became enraged since he, he uh, regarded Fran as his, his steady girlfriend and was jealous that he uh, she had been spending time with Mark. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Art, uh, we'll see. Well, that, you know what, I'm, I like I like your 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 guys' uh, perspective on that one. So let, let's yeah let's, let's throw in robbery. Yeah, let's do that. So sure underneath there we go. Copy down here. Okay. Okay. So we've got all the way down here. Um, right here. But here's the other thing we want to look at too. Now they discovered the only person in the store were, were Mark uh, who worked at the store and Fran a customer. Okay. Art became enraged since he regarded Fran as, as his steady girlfriend and was jealous that she had been spending time with Mark. Art announced we will chill these lovers out and load them into the truck. So we got, what is this now? We got um, kidnapping, Okay. And okay. Now, and load loaded them into the truck. Okay. Art drove a very short distance down the dirt road behind the store to a large large refrigerator. Okay. Still part of the um, part of the uh, kidnapping. Art loaded Fran and Mark in in the refrigerator. Now, Art then returned to the store to pick up Ben, who took, you know, this is Ben, you know, so we got the kidnapping uh, uh, taken by Art, and then down down here we've got, what is it that Ben is doing when, when he comes, when uh, Art returns? 
Okay, um, it's right here. Still part of the kidnapping right here. Okay, Art then returned to the store to pick up Ben, who took $250 from the cash register on his way out of the store. So we got Ben with the, with the larceny. Okay. Now, okay, got this now. Okay. The next day, the store manager saw that things were amiss and called police who who rescued Fran and Mark from the refrigerator. Okay. Oh, they both they, they both get larceny? Okay, yeah, you're right. Okay. Well, that's see the the aspect about the Pinkerton's rule would uh, would um charge Art with the, the larceny committed by Ben. And also but through Pinkertons we'd also we'd be able to get Ben for the for the kidnapping to um by art. The charge charge Ben with with the uh with the crime that art committed which was the kidnapping. Yeah. Could they could could you put the two two guys together? You know, I'm seeing that yes you could and that's where I'm gonna probably do that, you know, because right here I'll, I'll just grab this right here. That's the only difference. So we'll just we'll just cut that and we'll, we'll just come up here and throw that under there. Yeah, so sometimes you got to do this um, when you're outlining. It's the uh, strategy outlining and Ben. There we go. State v. Art and Ben. Okay, then I'll come down here now. We can just delete that. Okay, now, okay, good. Now, the next day, the store manager saw that things were amiss and called police, who rescued Fran and Mark from the refrigerator. Fran suffered, <clears throat> excuse me, Fran suffered no significant injury, but, oh, here's the thing. Maybe um, uh, the aspect about battery, they, they acted in concert. Yes, they did. Could, they, could you put two guys? Yeah, because they acted in concert. That's exactly right. Um, Fran no, suffered no significant injury, but Mark soon developed pneumonia and died as a result of, of it several weeks later. I would I would argue that uh, you maybe could throw in a, a battery aspect, possible through because of, of yeah yeah exactly. And then uh, so that I would take care of this uh, now that right here. Remember here that the uh, saw things were amiss and called police. So would you, uh, see? Would you say uh, year and a day? Exactly right. With Mark's in developed pneumonia, that has result several weeks later. That's exactly right. Year and a day. Very good. Very very good. Let's keep moving here. Murder of fe exactly felony murder. Murder of uh, Mark. Homicide. This is where we're going to get the year, the year and a day rule. Okay. And then actual cause, but for test. Proximate cause, which is the like the foreseeability intervening events aspect, and then. Murder, malice of forethought. Right, voluntary, <clears throat> voluntary defense. Yes, exactly. Now here's, here we're going to probably be able to get. Uh, well, let's see. Would be probably not. Probably probably depraved heart. Let's see. Intent to kill. Felony murder rule. Intent to cause serious bodily harm. And depraved heart. And we're also going to argue possibly involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, exactly. Criminal negligence. Okay. 
Excellent, excellent job there. Oh, how how the, for the criminal negligence? <clears throat> Excuse me. We're coming up here that that um, when uh, I remember what what uh, what the um, involuntary manslaughter is. It's it's an accidental homicide. Um, so what we're looking at here with the the accident is that technically they technically well they were they were put into the um, to the root to the refrigerator. And it was the accidental homicide aspect is that Mark soon developed pneumonia and died as a result of it several weeks later. Now, the, the coroner's report showed that Mark had an extraordinary susceptibility to pneumonia. Okay, there's that's something that we're going to talk about under, under um, right here, under da, 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 proximate cause. This is where we're going to throw in thin skull plaintiff. Okay, so now, okay, uh, and that it was triggered by exposure to the combination of viruses in the intense cold of the refrigerator. Okay, H2O skull, exactly. Also, all this go, goes to that. So I think we've, we've pretty much tackled all this. This is great. Make sure to highlight that too after this. Here. Okay, there we go. So going through it really, um, Quickly here, we got the solicitation, merger, conspiracy, Pinkerton's rule, accomplice liability, the burglary, which is going to be the modern law burglary, robbery, brandishing the brandishing the weapons, even though they were unloaded, uh, kidnapping, and then we got the larceny, taken uh, action taken by Ben for two hundred fifty dollars cash, the battery when they were when they uh, two when um, Fran and Mark were um, loaded and then put in into the refrigerator, uh, so they loaded into the car and put in the refrigerator. Yeah, and then uh, murder of Mark, and then we walk through our, all of our stuff here. Make sure to throw in your uh, involuntary manslaughter and the and the important that we work through all of our shopping list, including our defense of voluntary intoxication, which does does not uh, defeat um, because uh, defeat the aspect concerning the homicide. It might work against the um, the specific intent crimes, but with that being said, make sure to throw in a conclusion, and you'll have this thing. Okay. All right, this is great, fantastic, excellent job, team. Okay, I want to put a shout out to um, Chess Cruncher. Keep ch keep chess crunching, Chess Cruncher TV, and I also want to put a shout out to my Amazon Kindle book, Battling the Big Bad Baby Bar Essay Basics. And thank you for tuning in, and God bless.